for better days to come and carry us like wind in our sails. Hold on tight, I can smell the shore, it's right in front of us if we just hold on tight. This vision that I saw is getting closer every dawn. Dreamers of the from the west of Ireland where I live in um, with my uh, my family or two cats um, in a beautiful place amongst the heather um, on the hill, a hillside in uh, just very close to the coast uh, in County Mayo so um, my podcast is called Freochnitz because Freoch is the Irish word for heather so um, and it was the heather surrounding me here that inspired me to um, to give the name uh, to the podcast. So I um, am delighted to be back with you again. Um, it's been far too long. Um, I've spent the last, I suppose, six weeks since I last podcasted uh, doing all sorts of things, getting caught up with lots of really good things happening. Uh, life seems to be just um, full of um, energy at the moment. There's a lot happening, a lot going on, um, so I've just been a bit distracted and haven't had a moment to set aside to uh, to do the podcast. Um, yes, yeah, so you're all really welcome. Um, it's really good for to see all of you uh, who have been uh, loyal viewers for so long uh, coming back again, and very welcome to anybody who is watching this for the first time. And. Um, I usually put all of the information that I talk about in the show notes below, so if you need anything that is missing from there, please put in a comment and let me know if I've forgotten anything. So this podcast takes the usual format of um, looking at knitting, um, at what I have finished knitting, what I'm working on at the moment, and sometimes I talk about what I'm looking to do in the future. And um, yeah, and I talk about any acquisitions that have, have come my way, uh, come into my life since the last time that I talked to you. Um, so that's pretty much it. And then I do a second segment at the end of the podcast on um, some aspect of Irish culture. Um, and um, usually to do with the natural world, to do with trees or plants or flowers. And this week I'm doing part two of um, a section that I did on the Ohm script which is the earliest form of writing of the Irish language and I did a whole section on that in my last podcast so if you want to go back and look at that and um, that's there in, in number 20 I think it is I think this is number episode 21 and um, so yeah this week we'll be looking at a really brief look this time because I went into a lot of depth the last time and I'm literally just choosing four of the letters to look at they're the first four of the letters of the alphabet and just to look at their meanings and I'll also be putting up a little a symbol on screen which shows you what the, the letter looks like and um, so it's just a little dive into the the tree letters as they're known uh, and um, really just reminds us of the significance of the seasons and the the turning of the year um, and the natural world to 
the people who came up with this alphabet uh, all those thousands of years ago. Like, um, so it's, uh, yeah, that's what we're going to be looking at. So you're all really welcome here. I hope you've got your knitting with you. I hope you've got a nice drink, whether that's a hot drink for all of us. It's still freezing cold here in the Northern Hemisphere. <laughs> Um, or else you guys down in the south, um, south of the equator, who might be experiencing some really nice summer temperatures. So with us, we're just in the very, very uh, uh, sort of transitory period between the winter and the spring. Um, I mean, it technically is spring in Ireland, anyhow, in the Celtic calendar. It's been spring since the 1st of February, since St. Bridget's Day. And the last podcast I put out was would have been around that time. I think it was the 31st of January. So I didn't talk about St. Bridget this year. But my podcast from last year from around this time deals with her and her whole life. The life of the Celtic Bridget, uh, the goddess, and how her personality and her attributes became uh, part of the, the life of the, the Christian saint. And um, or became her personality and her... Um, Yep, uh, her, her characteristics. So St. Bridget is a really important saint for us and so is the Celtic goddess Breed. Uh, my middle name is Breed, um, which is so nice. So I feel like I have a connection, a strong connection to, to Bridget um, because of the, the name that I've been given. And, uh, and this time of the year is, it really is fantastic because we've got more light in the evenings and in the mornings getting up, it's getting slightly easier. It's still really cold and we're moving into March. So March, today's the 10th of March and March in Ireland tends to be a really uh, uh, unpredictable month in terms of weather. So we can have really awful wintry weather one day and then the next day we can, it can feel really like spring. And at the moment we're going through that. And St. Patrick's Day weather, so St. Patrick's Day is next Sunday, 17th. So we're getting close to that as well. And St. Patrick is our um, patron saint, our male patron saint, actually St. Bridget is also a patron saint um, and St. Bridget has been honoured with a, a bank holiday in Ireland, a public holiday, uh, which we had at the beginning of February. So anyhow, St. Patrick is coming up um, and on his day we have the parade um, and my memories of a as a child of being in the St. Patrick's Day parade or watching it were always of being absolutely freezing cold uh, and having um, hailstones and wind and rain and uh, and then a few minutes later the sun would come blazing through and the clouds are usually scudding across the sky so it's all really wild wild weather um, like it really is um, it is a month of very changeable uh, often really really cold and miserable weather where you still want to be indoors but we're starting that whole thing of moving outside which is lovely and enjoying nature and getting back out again and feeling a little bit more awake uh, because of the light. So um, that's the introduction. Um, if you want to um, find me anywhere on social media, I am on Instagram and I'm, I actually haven't been terribly active there. Uh, in fact, the last time I posted was when I finished this shawl that I'm wearing, um, the flare shawl and um, which is quite a, uh, a good few weeks ago it's probably about four weeks ago uh, so I'm sorry I haven't been posting there but I literally just have been so busy um, with my life and uh, which is a good thing um, but yeah you can find me on Instagram and you can find me on Ravelry I also don't update my Ravelry pages but uh, I'm there anyway if you want to say hello uh, Instagram is probably the best place to get me though I also have a Ko-fi account if you'd like to support the, this podcast um, I'd be really grateful for that and uh, just a word of thanks to, huge thanks to the really generous support of the people who have been contributing to, to that account, that account uh, financially um, contributing to the, the filming of this podcast and the time that it takes. Um, but anyhow, that's where we're at at the moment. So, okay, so without any further ado, let's uh, dive into the knitting. Um, I have two finished objects, both of which I'm wearing at the moment today. I'm wearing the flare shawl, which is um, an absolutely dreamy shawl that I am so happy with. Um, it's funny because when I was knitting this the last time, I wasn't terribly sure about it. Um, I wasn't terribly sure about the colour, which is peach, which uh, ultimately it's, 
it's a, there are two different coloured yarns but ultimately the overall effect of the shawl is a peach shawl which I thought it's really not me. Having said that it's really grown on me <laughs> and um, I've really come to like it. Um, it is by, um, it's a very well known pattern, it's a free pattern from um, Espastri Co and it is called the Fleur Shawl. Um, did I write anything down about it? Um, I didn't. Isn't that amazing? In my notes, I have scribbled a few notes down today. <laughs> and I have conveniently forgotten to write about this. It doesn't matter because um, I spoke about it in my last podcast and it is, um, uh, the details are that there are two skeins of yarn that I would have picked. One of them I picked up at the the Doolin Festival of Yarn um, last year, the first yarn festival that I've ever been at. at um, it was held in Doolin in County Clare last October. And I know that that festival is, it's called This Is Knit. Is it? Or is that the name of the, sorry. I'm getting, I'm getting my, am I getting the shop in Dublin mixed up with the name of the festival? Anyway, I'll put it up on the screen, the name of the festival. <laughs> and um, it's a yarn festival which is happening this year in 2024 um, at the end of September, I think, instead of the end of October. And it's happening in Ennis, which is a um, the county town in, in Clare. It's the, big, it's the biggest town, I think, in Clare. And um, so it'll just mean better facilities, more space for people to park. Um, and I'm really looking forward to hopefully getting to, the, to that festival. Um, I wouldn't miss the Yarn Festival uh, <laughs> if I have the chance of going at all. So yeah, this is the Flower Shawl. The, um, the, the sort of pinky colour was from that, um, from the festival. And it is by um, the name of the dyer is um, escaping me at the moment. Um, she is an Irish uh, independent dyer, yarn dyer. Um, and I'll put up her details here. And the other one is Hedgehog Fibres. It's a, um, as you can see, it's sort of more yellowy color. And that is uh, by, um, yeah, by Hedgehog Fibres. And it was from a collection of three skeins of yarn that I got. Um, in a mystery bundle that I bought um, when they were doing a special offer and um, yeah so that was um, something in a way that I probably would never have picked up because of the colour because it's really yellowy um, and um, it was only then when I was going through my stash looking at what I had trying to decide what I would use for the shawl that I felt these two colours would complement each other. So I've done, there are two versions of the flower shawl and I've done one which is two different colours together in a sort of a striped pattern. So you can just, because the colours are close to each other, you can just about see the stripes of the sort of neon -y, yellowy, pinky hedgehog fibres yarn and uh, most of the, the, the white stripes are all in the um, spring petals is the name of the colour and I'm still blanking on the name of the dyer, sorry. So anyway, um, Fine leaf fibres, that's it, it's fine leaf fibres is the name of the dyer. Um, so yeah, this this is the, the one where you have the sort of striped version and the bobbles on the striped version are, I think, supposed to be bigger. Um, they're a bigger bobble, but I did the smaller version. So I sort of did a mix of the two shawls. I did a smaller bobble and I did the, uh, the sort of striped version. So as you can see, this is the coziest thing ever. Oh yeah, the other thing is of course it's held double with uh, silk mohair. And the silk mohair I chose was a, I think it's Bichy Bouche and it's just a, a neutral a cream colour. And um, I absolutely adore this piece. It's so warm and toasty, it's really, really light. I mean, I really just do think that when you're holding um, merino singles or merino of any sort with a silk mohair, you get the nicest fabric. It's just a really lovely, um, it's a really lovely thickness and it's so light and it's so warm and it's, it just seems to be really special, really, really good. Um, so I'm thrilled that I was able to use up those two skeins of yarn in such a nice way. 
and um, I have been wearing this constantly, especially because I work uh, I work from home and try not to have the heat on all day. Um, and this shawl is absolutely perfect for for that purpose. So um, that's that. Um, and my second finished object then is the sweater that I'm wearing. And this is just to take, give you an idea of the the look. So this is oversized compared to the pattern and I think so my gauge was 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 bigger my gauge is about 15 stitches I think to four inches and I think the gauge of the pattern is more like 16 or 17 can't remember which 17 I think and um, this is the Ewan sweater and um, you would have seen that I was working on this the last time as well and I had decided to make an adjustment to it this also hasn't been blocked so we can't really get the full impression of what it's going to be like. I'm still actually in two minds as to whether to go ahead and block it or whether to um, uh, whether to completely rip the whole thing out. <laughs> I'm actually at this point in my knitting career where I feel like if I don't, if I'm not happy with something, that it's better for me to actually start completely from scratch, to rip the whole thing out and start again. And I don't see a problem with that. Um, in, I mean, I don't think it's a waste of time. Um, I think I do, it, I mean, there are so many lessons to be learned when you knit something and it doesn't really turn out the way you want to want it to. And I've got to the point where I'm actually happier to go back to, to square one rather than to live with something that I'm not entirely happy with. Um, and actually, because this is so big, the, 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 uh, the gauge is so big on this, um, it really doesn't take that long to knit. Uh, and it's such a pleasure to knit actually because again it's so this is Siri Togfa. If you didn't see it the last time, this is the yarn, it's Siri Togfa three ply. So this is a three ply yarn from the Faroe Islands. So very good value. I think it was 560 euros per 100 grams. Um, and this is 165 meters to 100 grams of yarn. So it's a um, what weight would you call it? A, it's an iron weight really, uh, I think. Um, worsted or iron weight, and that's held double. I held it double with the with the silk bone hair as well. So the fabric I've got here, I absolutely love. I love the design, the details of this. By the way, it's by November Knits. I should have said that the Ewan sweater by November Knits. Um, I love the details of the raglan. I love the big big uh, sleeves so wide sleeves with a um, a big uh, a long ribbon on the cuff uh, which actually could be longer um, and the one thing I did one aspect of the sweater that I didn't like was the big side sl split seam and the very long um, ribbing but while I loved the actually did love the look of it on the model in the picture but it when I knit it I so I knit it that way first and it just didn't suit my shape. So I decided to rip that back and re knit down. So I knit down to um, my hip bone, I suppose, the level of my hip bone, and then I um, knit down three inches. So I'm just going to snap it quickly. I don't know if you can see this, but this is the, the sweater. I'm not sure if this is going to be in, but that's the length of the, the ribbing that I knit. Um, and you can see that it's quite oversized. I also made it longer at the back. I did a, a short row shaping uh, at the back. And that is where I'm at with it. So my one issue at the moment is that I my uh, row gauge was probably too long. And this happened to me before with the billy pullover as well. So my gauge is off, which didn't really matter, I felt, for the row gauge, but I didn't consider my... Um, or sorry for the stitch count, but I didn't consider my row gauge. But actually you end up having a really low point in your um, in the raglan. So the raglan ends up being quite long. And the issue then is that you have, um, um, if, you, if you're wearing this under a coat, that you're catching the under the sleeve. Also, I tried pinning it up and it just looks so much better with the raglan farther up underneath my, um, underneath my armpit, so um, yeah. The issue as well was that there was no schematic in the, um, I think I would have felt 
more comfortable knowing what uh, depth the um, the raglan was supposed to be for my size. So I didn't have that information because it wasn't in the, there was no schematic in the pattern. So that's one sort of little problem I have with the pattern. I mean, I'm not blaming the pattern for what I've got because I was an entirely different gauge and I was trying to, you know, squeeze it in. But uh, anyway, oh, there are loads of issues. I love the jumper in some respects. It's so light, it's so uh, comfortable. I love the fabric. Um, but I do think it's oversized in certain ways that I just don't, I don't know if I can live with or I think I might be happier to, to rip back and try again. Um, and really just treat this project as a whole learning curve and uh, a way for me to advance and to really pay attention. <laughs> I, mean, I think I really needed to pay more attention for, to my gauge at the very beginning. I think I was going on a gauge swatch that I had done for another project and put away and, and I mean it was only a couple of weeks previously but I picked it out again and I was sure that I had used the 5.5mm needle for that gauge swatch but maybe I didn't. Um, you know, so my gauge swatch wasn't actually what I ended up getting. And I also have the thing where when I'm knitting, I get looser. My gauge definitely gets looser, which means I must check my gauge as I'm going. Um, yeah, so. Hi again, everyone. And um, I am back with, um, I was just finishing talking to you about the Dune sweater, so. Um, and I was talking to you about the issues I had with Gage and whether I would consider actually starting the whole project. So I just wanted to do a little poll and see whether which viewers think I should start again or should I just block it out and see um, what it comes out like if I block it. I'm terrified of blocking it actually because I think it's gonna, it'll set it I suppose, it'll be impossible to rip out. Um, anyway, it's an interesting one but uh, you know, it'd be lovely to hear your opinion on that. So the next thing I have to show you is a third finished object, which I'd forgotten I had. So I have these, this pair of socks. So these are, um, I just seem to be knitting the same uh, sock type. It's just a vanilla sock. There's nothing special about it. Um, with a shadow wrap short row heel from Denise DeSantis. So this is my favorite heel. And the toes are just the ones where you decrease um, yeah, I think it's every second row, every second round, um, you decrease four stitches, one at each each end on each side of the magic loop, and then when you get to the end, you do a, a Kitchener stitch toe for the last ten or so stitches. And these are um, made with yarn that I wasn't too sure what to do with, so I'm absolutely thrilled with them. Again, they're a mohair and merino mix. And these are the yarns here. So we have um, this gorgeous, actually variegated yarn from Hedgehog Fibres. Again, this is one that I got in the mystery bag. So I had that uh, yellowy, um, sort of neony, pinky speckled one that I used in my flower shawl. So that was this yellow here um, that I was showing you a moment ago. This was um, the Hedgehog Fibres. Uh, yellow colour that I got from the mystery um, three scheme mystery bag and this is another one and they're just simply called this is called they're just called potluck I think and this is a hundred percent merino called oh so fine so it really is so soft the softest merino and I paired that with the, um, with the silk mohair that I had in my stash for years um, sorry now using the yarn that is um, from Pearl Soho and it's called Tussock so you're probably familiar with this if you've ever been on Pearl Soho's website and it the colors are absolutely stunning so this was on a special offer at one stage about two or three years ago when I was ordering other yarn from Pearl Soho and I decided to buy it and try it out and um, it is called Jade as the color and I love the color so much but I was never sure what to do with it and then I put it beside this other skein of yarn that I wasn't sure, so sure what to do with it and I just thought they will definitely complement each other. And this is the amazingly gorgeous sort of sea green that I got from mixing the two. Oh, and the orange, so I wasn't sure, amazingly I wasn't sure if I'd have enough of this just to do 
the sock the whole color the, se the same color throughout and look at how much I've left over so I have no idea what I was calculating um, anyway the yardage or the meterage that I was calculating there would have been plenty to do the two socks but instead I used and I don't have have it here to hand I forgot to to get it but I had a an, a silk packa in an um, from Malabrigo um, called glazed carrot so this beautiful beautiful really bright orange color of silk packa which is basically a lace weight um, alpaca and silk blend instead of alpaca instead of mohair and silk and uh, so I used that for the the cuffs and the heels and the toes so there we go two beautiful beautiful cozy warm really stunning color I love this color uh, I love uh, JD green sea I, the sea at the moment has the most beautiful shade of um, of green at this time of the year it um, I can't even, it's almost like a sage green or it goes between sage and jade. It's just absolutely stunning. And we're lucky to live so close to it that we see it changing every day. It's a different color green every day. And sometimes it's, it's, an, it's a slate gray and sometimes it's a opal blue. And uh, it's just an incredible thing to watch day to day. So depending on the sky, depending on the weather, depending on what's going on underneath the water, I suppose as well. So there you go, they're my socks. Uh, very excited to now have knit two pairs of socks already this year and we're only into March so you never know I might actually do a pair a month I was thinking of trying to do that we'll see how I get on so moving swiftly along to another work in progress so I have um, been working on the half and half triangles wrap and I showed you this the last time and I have progressed hugely so I did an awful lot of work on this actually this has been a really nice knit uh, as everybody will tell you, it is so addictive and so comforting. And I have reached the second colour. So I'm on to, um, that's the wrong side. I'm on to the second colour in my half and half wrap. And I am using, the colours I'm using are, the green is um, juniper green. And the creamy whitey colour is wheat flour. Um, so I've done pretty much, I think I've done half of the stitches, but as you know, anybody who's done this project, it gets slower and slower when you're doing the second half because the rows are getting longer and longer and longer. And this really is absolutely massive. <laughs> so <laughs> it's really hard to show it on the screen. Um, but just to let you know that I was doing that in, I had originally intended to do it or at least not originally, originally, but the last time I showed it to you, I was probably showing you that I was going to go on to this colour, which is, uh, what's this one? This is the Fresh Pickle. These are Pearl Soho Linen Quill, by the way, which is the really beautiful combination of alpaca and linen and uh, Highland, Peruvian Highland wool. And it is the softest, most, I don't know, most uh, full of character yarn. Um, for its really good value except that I have to import it from the States so it gets expensive because of customs and shipping and all that sort of stuff but um, so I had anyhow it's worth it because it's, I, I really haven't found a substitute for it at all um, on this side of the Atlantic Ocean maybe there is one uh, that I don't know about yet if anybody knows a really good substitute and I've tried other, I've tried substitutes which just have linen and um, and merino or linen yeah linen and merino and linen and other types of just just wool and um, they just don't have the same drape and so I thought it was the linen, linen that gave it the drape but I was listening to somebody in a knitting podcast recently saying it's the alpaca that gives drape or at least alpaca gives a lot of drape to a project, so that was news to me. I wasn't, I hadn't realised that. But this colour is the wheat flower, which I had originally intended to use with the juniper green. I actually bought it to use with the juniper green. Then my sister was doing one of these wraps, and she was using kettle black, and asked me, and she was going to use a different colour that she had bought with her kettle black. I can't remember which one it was. And then she thought this would go much better with the black. So I said, you can take mine, no problem thinking that I could use this, which I had in stash, and not order any more. And then when it came to doing it, I thought, oh my God, I really want to do it in the wheat flour. So as it turned out, she had actually, I think about 70 grams left of her third skein of this. So I went ahead and 
I don't know what I've done with it. I was going to show you the full skein of my lovely linen quill. And I can't find it. I'm squeaking my chair. No, I don't know what I've done with it. Um, my full skein of linen quill in this. I bought two of them anyway. It's all I had to buy because um, 270 grams will be plenty for me to do the third triangle. I think I measured... I had, out of three skeins of yarn on the green, I had a 35 gram uh, ball left, which means that I used 265 grams, which actually is more than my sister, who only used 230, roughly. I think she had about a 70 gram ball of this, of the white left over, uh, but she is much tighter gauge than me. So there was a difference of like, how much is that, 40 grams? So I used 40 grams extra for one triangle than she did. Uh, so it just shows you there's quite a significant difference that can be engaged and that's I suppose why your pattern, the pattern has to say you need three skeins of yarn even though some people I think you know felt oh gosh we've only got a tiny bit left over here or we've a tiny bit used as a third ball so uh, but that's why they have to do that so um, yeah so there we are I'm getting to knit in my favourite uh, original intended colour I think your intuition, intuition does tell you when you see something what you want and when you try and move away from that sometimes it just doesn't work even though I actually had started knitting with a fresh pickle but it just wasn't doing it for me so I only had to order two skeins of that which is brilliant because keeping the costs down uh, seeing as it has to be brought in from the states so the third work in progress then or the second work in progress actually is um, another uh, shawl actually or not it's not a shawl it's a wrap and this is um, my beginnings of the Amy, no, it's by Amy Miller. It's called the Second Avenue Wrap. Um, and the reason that this caught my eye, well, it caught my eye because it's springtime and I really wanted to do something with loads of colour. Um, also because of the fact that I actually had each, I had a, a skein of each of the colours in the pattern. So I put the pattern up here and you can see what I'm talking about. So I have this. Um, which is the uh, linen quill in red poppy which actually was a colour that my sister had ordered a couple of years ago and when it came it just doesn't look like poppy at all really so this is a funny thing about some of the linen quill colours the, the colour on the screen is very different in some of them, not all of them I mean the, the juniper green was really close to what it looked like on screen the wheat flower looks like what it looks like on the screen but the red poppy doesn't look like red poppy to me actually when you get it in front of you and you're looking at it in real life it looks like a really really sort of neony orangey colour um, red poppy, a poppy colour to me is a much deeper red uh, much redder red like my, more scarlet so she just thought she'd never use it and I said oh I'll definitely use that <laughs> and give it to me but I haven't used it except that I found this project now which has a really sort of neony red in it and uh, it's this gorgeous shawl which is really spring-like and I'll show you the other colours that are in it there's going to be grey and there's going to be the chartreuse that you've seen me use before this is from uh, Life in the Long Grass which I was using in a project by uh, a design by um, Vera Vanamaki it was a, a sort of a, a top that I was, I was knitting with um, a with some other life in the long grass, linen and merino in the colour grove and I that project is stalled and I don't know if I'm going to continue with it I think I may actually just frog it all together um, but so we have this one, this colour is going to come next and then we have grey and this is also leftover life in the long grass I'm not going to have enough in this so I probably will have to buy a skein of that um, but this then there's the blue next and then there'll be a whole load, there'll be stripes of the red, red and white stripes. So that's the, there are the colours there, if you can see them, for my shawl and the cream of course. Um, so we have Pearl Soho, this one is Kremka Soul Wool, Lazy Linen, uh, Life in the Long Grass, uh, Merino Singles for the two, the grey and the green. Um, so that's there are the colours, they're my spring colours, so very happy with this, how it's going. It's a really simple pattern, it's um, back and forth, uh, so there's a lot of purling, but I don't mind purling. So you're literally going back, uh, knitting 
it's knit on one side and pearl, pearl on the other. So it's a one-sided shawl. It's about 25 inches across, uh, so it's not a shawl, it's more like a wrap. Uh, and it has this cute little uh, scalloped detail. This when this blocks out, it'll be flat. It's not supposed to be, um, it's not supposed to be sort of springing up like that. Um, and at the other end, I think there's a pico edge to the other, the other end of it. So I'd say it'll knit up in no time really, even though it is fingering weight. Um, but I'm very happy with that project. It's really bringing a bit of um, spring, a spring feeling into my knitting at the moment. Um, I'm also working on the pressed flower shawl. Um, I wasn't going to show it to you, but actually I might as well, just in case you're new here and you haven't seen this before, but I was showing it the last time. Um, there's really very little else more to say about, I haven't progressed very far at all. Um, pull these out. And this is where I've got, so, and I've actually stopped in the middle of a row, I think. I have stopped in the middle of a row, because the rows at this, in this project are slow, and I probably just had to stop and jump up and do something. And um, that's where we're at with that, but it's a, a fabulous, fabulous pattern. I absolutely love it. Uh, this one has a mix of mohair and um, I'm using um, merino singles, our sock yarn from Life in the Long Grass in the pink. Uh, the blue is a um, Rama phenol garn and the, uh, there are two different colour mohairs. Um, one is a sort of a purple which is going with the blue and the other one is a white which is going with pink. And um, so I'm um, doing shading the, the, the colour of the flowers uh, alternating between pink and sort of a light pink. So that's the other, so it's amazing at the moment. Um, I'm on shawls and I think three shawls on the go. And I think that happens when I do a knit like this one, which is sort of problematic. I do garment and I am not too happy with the way the garment has worked out. And I go, okay, I just want something simple <laughs> to keep my mind off having to work out gauge. So that's what I'm up to at the moment. And I have finally to show you, um, have I anything else there in, that's all the whips. And the last thing I have is one acquisition, which is this absolutely stunning color yarn. This is uh, a hand dyed skein of merino singles from a, a dyer in Spain. So I was on holidays in Spain for my, um, for the midterm break, for my, my son's midterm break from school. And because he's just gone into secondary school, it's the first year that we've had a whole week off at that time of the year. Um, and that was really early in February. It was the sort of second week in February because Easter is so early. Easter is the 31st of March this year. So their midterm is always halfway between their Christmas, returning after Christmas and the Easter break. Um, and it's usually a much longer term than this year. It's very short. So we were finding ourselves jetting off to Spain, to the south of Spain, where we have uh, friends who have um, a lovely apartment um, near Granada. So we went into Granada one of the days to go shopping in Lola, let me get this right, Lola y Punto is the name of the shop and uh, you can look her up on Instagram. She's a designer, the shop owner is also a designer, pattern designer and uh, has beautiful patterns for sale and has beautiful yarn that she dyes herself and um, I was just so happy to be able to visit the shop and to meet her and to see the yarn in its, all its glory and I, brought, I bought home, brought home one skein as souvenir skein because I'm really trying to keep cut down on the amount of yarn I'm buying but I just couldn't leave this one behind. It's such a gorgeous colour. So I have no idea what I'm going to do with this but I'm sure one day it will find itself into a really beautiful project. The, um, the name of the yarn, by the way, is, so Lola y Punto, I'll put it up on the screen or in the show notes, and the name of the, um, the yarn is Tanana, so T-A-N-A-N-A, -A -N -A, Tanana Yarns. Oops, there, there we go, that's that. And um, yeah, so we went, we went uh, to Granada, we didn't get to see the Al Alhambra, um, because we didn't have a ticket booked and if you don't have a ticket booked you won't get in. It's pretty much, it's a World Heritage site so it's really, um, 
it's the, it's booked out nearly every day of the year and um, but we did get to see the outside of the Alhambra which actually was also very interesting you know just really nice to see the citadel um, and how it relates to the city of Granada and the old town the old city of Granada um, and we actually had a lovely time just walking around and for me I don't like crowds too much um, especially at heritage sites I find sometimes it really detracts from the whole experience and it's really difficult with world heritage sites actually to know if they're a good thing because they bring so many people from all over the world and they really highlight a place and sometimes it's too much you know sometimes you really lose something you lose the spirit of the place if there are too many people there um, and also my friend who was was going to be showing me around uh, so we we both have this, a similar background we both were at college together we both studied history of art and so we both have a huge interest in history of art and architecture and uh, she really loved it but she said it took her about eight hours to get through the place so you know you have to be really dedicated <laughs> And I was exhausted when I was there because we had just spent two days in the mountains uh, skiing. We were lucky to ski in the Sierra Nevada again this year for a second time. Well, we didn't do it last year. Hi again everybody. And um, I'm just going to finish off the podcast with the section on Irish culture. Um, I finished with the knitting. Um, and um, yeah, so the uh, section on Irish culture will be looking at a couple of things. One of them is the OM uh, script that I was talking to you about. I'm going to look at the first five letters of the OM alphabet and their meanings, the meanings of the letters. This is following on from the section I did on my last podcast, episode 20, if you want to look back on that, um, where I looked at the, uh, the, you know, the history of the, the script the Ohm script, where it came from, what, what it's all about, and its association with trees. Um, and so I thought that I there was so much information in that that I would leave some of it to subsequent podcasts to look at the actual letters themselves. So we'll be looking at the, I'll put up a, uh, an image of the shape of the letter and what its name is and where that name comes from. And we look at five of them this week. I think there are 20 of them all together. So we'll, We'll be looking at them in future podcasts as well. And before I get into that, I just wanted to talk to you a tiny little bit about um, today is Mother's Day here in Ireland. And um, I just wanted to show you what I got from Mother's Day, which is the most beautiful box of chocolates called um, Skellig's Chocolates. So my lovely son Reuben, uh, who is 13, uh, chose these chocolates and I am absolutely thrilled. It's such a lovely thing to get for Mother's Day. I feel really special and really, really appreciate it. Um, and I had been looking at these recently and thinking, oh, they look lovely. I'd really like to have a taste of them. I've never had them before, but they are Irish made handmade chocolates from uh, Kerry from County Kerry and uh, the Skelligs in case you don't know are is the name of two little islands that are located off the uh, tip of the uh, the southwest coast of Ireland off the tip of the Ivera Peninsula and um, they're a really interesting set of islands I mean they're so picturesque anyway uh, for a start because they are literally shaped like pyramids and they're they're located about seven miles off the coast so they look like magical islands, they often look like they're floating on the water um, because of the mists and, and the general uh, atmosphere that you're looking through to, to see to them, see out to them. They're, um, they do look like a mythical place and they are really well known um, uh, from the time that they were, they acted as a film location for one of the Star Wars films recently, one of the um, subsequent um, sort of Star Wars, what do you call it, uh, extra films that they make. I can't remember which number it was, was it? Because four, five and six are the three ones they made in the 70s, isn't that it? And I think the uh, one, two and three, I'm not sure which one of them stuff that the Skellix appears in, but it was, um, yeah, so they've been made famous anyway by the Star Wars films. And um, I actually had the, privilege of managing to visit there 
in 2001, which is now 23 years ago, so I can't believe that. I went as part of my uh, master's, the master's uh, degree that I was doing in building conservation. And um, because one of the people who, one of the professors who taught on the program um, was a, uh, worked for the, o the Office of Public Works, the OPW, so he was looking after the conservation of the buildings on the island. So there are, actually, there, there are actually buildings on these tiny, tiny little rocks out in the middle of the sea because it was the location of a, um, a monastic site, an early Christian monastic site. And um, the, uh, the buildings that are there are known as beehive huts. I'll put up a picture of a beehive hut. And these are uh, really fascinating huts that were built by the monks for shelter when they were living there. Um, and they are, it's amazing because even today when you walk inside one of these huts, they're bone dry. There's, there's no water inside them. There's no rain getting in. You know, there's just no weather getting in. Um, it's absolutely phenomenal because these are so exposed, these sites are. Um, and or at least the islands are exposed. The actual site where the buildings are is a little sort of a sheltered spot. Um, the only sheltered spot on this tiny island. Um, and um, the, the way they built the huts, they corbelled the stones, so they actually layered them on top of each other to get this arch um, self-supporting uh, without really using much except what was there. They didn't have very, you know, they didn't have building materials, they literally just had the stone that was on the island. Um, they couldn't be transporting stuff across from the mainland. And um, yeah, they built them out of the materials that they found and they're still standing, so that's like, they, these are dating to early Christian times, so that's like 6th to the, to the 8th century around that time, and so we're looking at 14 or 1500 years of life of a building, you know, it's absolutely phenomenal in the most rugged and uh, inhospitable environment that you've ever been to. So if you ever get the chance to go there, I mean, apart from the fact that it is, it, it has become a really big destination for anybody who's inter interested in films and Star Wars, but you know, from a cultural point of view, it's they're, they're absolutely fascinating. And I was just reading up a little bit about them there. They are they were designated a World Heritage, a UNESCO World Heritage site in 1996. So they are protected and they, um, I mean, when we went there, it was fascinating how, it was quite scary in one way. I uh, don't know whether they've made it safer since, but you have to be, first of all, you have to have sea legs, legs together because it's sort of very rough and we went in a tiny little fishing boat and when you get out to the island this the landing spot is um, tidal or it's at least not tidal it's right beside these rough waves that must be tidal so you've got to go at the right time but also you've got to wait to the wave to, for the wave to lift the boat and then you jump off you know, there's no harbour as such because it's it's just a, it's a crag, it's a stone coming straight out of the water. And uh, so you literally have to wait till the boat gets lifted by the wave, you jump off and then the wave drops down and the boat goes from under you. So you have to, you know, grab onto somebody's hand to get onto the island. And then to get up to where the monks lived, you have to walk up this winding, narrow sort of staircase, which um, is just these stones built into the, the rock. And there are no handrails or anything, so you're literally just walking up above the sea, up this really steep stone staircase. So it's a really atmospheric, fascinating place. And I wanted to let you know about this book as well called Haven by Emma Donoghue, which is also um, has a big connection with the Skellics because, as you can see, uh, it's the the main feature of the um, the front cover of the book is a picture of the of the Skellics. Um, Skellig Michael is the name of the bigger island. I can't remember what this. I think Skellig Bjork might be the smaller one, which means lit literally small Skellig. Um, and this is a fictitious um, account of three monks who uh, who lived on the island or who lived on the in the at the monastic site. So it's a reconstruction almost. Of what life might have been like there for it's not a documentary it's not, it's not a um it's not non-fiction it is it is a story it's fiction but apparently it's very very realistic she did an awful lot of research to come up with the details of their lives and how how difficult it was to live there but um the other reason you might go is if you're interested in birds wild birds and um, because it's a uh, habitat for puffins and gannets and 
uh, oh, there's also a seal colony. There are over 50 seals. So it is a uh, really a place that is magical, well worth visiting. If you ever get the chance to go down to the south, very southwest corner of Ireland, uh, if you're ever here. Um, and the book is worth reading as well. I have started reading this but haven't managed, it's quite dense, so I haven't managed to actually get through the first sort of uh, initial stages of it to get to really know the characters, but I'm interested to pers persevere and keep going with that. So I have my chocolates and my, my skeleton chocolates and my book, Emma Donoghue's book, um, <laughs> Um, which I will really be uh, cuddling up with, I think, this evening when I'm when I'm going to bed. I'm going to be reading, the, reading, and maybe having a chocolate. <laughs> so um, there you go. That's my Mother's Day uh, delightful um, contribution from my lovely gift from my son. Um, the other thing I was going to tell you about um, there was something. I'm sorry that I was going to say to you about about the skeletics. Um, the name apparently is from Old Norse, so it's a really unusual name. It literally means a, a sharp rock, Skellig, but it doesn't appear in Irish place names. Um, it's very seldom seen in Irish place names. There's only a couple of places, uh, also Bun Skellig in County Cork, and in Temple of Skellig, which is in Glendalough in County Wicklow, but they reckon it's from Old Norse. Um, but it's very sort of onomatopoeic, I think. It sounds like rock, for me anyway. Skellig sounds like rock. Um, and um, it is... Yeah, that's pretty much all I was going to tell you about it. But there's a ton of um, folklore and mythology that's associated with this island, with these islands. Um, and they're, they're just a fascinating place to see and visit. And if you get a chance to walk up that stone staircase and get to the, the beehive huts, I highly recommend it. You can also see beehive huts on the actual peninsula itself, so you don't have to, you don't actually have to go to the islands to see them. There's a place called the Gal Galeris Oratory, I think it's called, uh, which is also, which is on the peninsula itself, on the mainland, um, which you can visit and you can get to see what a beehive hut looks like. Anyhow, so I'm going to just look quickly at some of the own letters now and um, the first one is Beh, remember the name of the alphabet is Beh Lesnin and the first word is Beh which means, um, literally means, um, sorry it's the Irish word for birch, the birch tree and um, seasonally the birch is associated with uh, rebirth and so, or at least the tree is, is associated with, with rebirths, so you have this um, occurring seasonally at the beginning of the year, um, whether that be um, the winter solstice or Imbolc. So Imbolc is the name for the cross quarter day that happens um, on, at the beginning of February. So uh, the last time I podcasted actually it was just before that, it was the 31st of January that the podcast went out. And I didn't talk about um, the importance then of the feast of St. Bridget and our, our goddess, our Celtic goddess, uh, Bridget, also Bridget. Um, but I spoke about both of those characters or those figures in the podcast that I put out this time last year. Uh, I went into great detail about them. And um, so if you want to look back at that podcast, all that information is there in those. So the birch tree is associated with that time of the year with Imbolc um, and um, it's associated with rebirth. And so that's what the first letter of the Om alphabet means. The second letter then, it doesn't have a direct meaning in terms of the name of a tree. It's called Lys, L-U-I-S, and there are two possible meanings, either uh, Lys or Lysha, meaning flame or radiance. Uh, my niece is called Lysha and that her name comes from the same word, from the same root. Uh, so it means bright or radiant. Beautiful name for a person. And um, the other meaning for Lys is plant, herb or vegetable. So um, the letter name refers to the rowan with its flame red berries. So this is the radiance the flame. And also seasonally it is associated with the festival of the goddess Bridget. Uh, or in Bullock, the beginning of spring, and this um, the goddess is has a strong link with fire and with flames. So um, 
this link was carried then into the folklore of the Christian saint as well, the Christian saint Bridget who succeeded her. So the flaming tree, uh, the flaming berries and also the, the association with the beginning of the year and with flame, um, really the association with the rowan tree means that Lis is the word that's given for, for rowan. So we have birch and then rowan and then the third letter we have refers to the, the alder tree uh, and that, that word is fern so the third letter of the um, Ohm alphabet is called fern and that's the Irish word for alder and seasonally um, in springtime the alder has it, its catkins are out and the red sap for which the alder is noted can also be seen in the opening buds and interestingly as well the alder's catkins and its bark are noted for their use in dye making in the making of dyes so um so that's the third letter so we have be, lis, fern so we have birch rowan and alder are the first three native irish trees um who are so which are associated with the first letters of the alphabet the fourth one then is sal and again this is an irish name for willow so it's already it's a name um that's already used for a tree so there isn't an oblique meaning in the same way that there is with lis for the rowan uh, and anybody who's a gardener will know that the latin word for um, for the willow tree is salix and um, so the word sal is from the Latin root for, for salix um, and seasonally the willow's catkins are an important source of nectar for the bees in the springtime um, and one of the tree's most distinctive features and um, it's noted for its ability to root and grow quickly which would also place it symbolically in the springtime the season of growth and actually, just thinking about the, the willows, catkins, I remember we used to have Easter trees in our house that we got the idea from my sister who lived in Germany in the 1980s uh, for a few years and she brought back um, these beautiful little papier-mâché painted eggs and wooden eggs uh, from Germany and uh, we thought they were absolutely beautiful and she brought back the idea as well of putting an Easter tree up so we used to collect the most decorative branches that we could find so the ones with the most catkins on them and we had the lovely hanging catkins from the willow tree and then the pussy willow which had the sort of fluffy grey fluffy catkin with the sort of yellow fur on it as well so that was something we used to do um, at that time and um, we were probably one of the few people in Ireland who used to do it because it was definitely wasn't a tradition here in this country to have a hammer willow tree. Um, yes, yeah, so the fifth letter of the Ohm alphabet um, and that is the letter Nin. So this is where the alphabet gets its name by Lys Nin. So the first, the second and the fifth letters give it the name. And this means, the word literally means branch fork, but it refers to the tree, um, the wild cherry tree. So Nin means wild cherry and the way we can see the uh, link between the, um, the word Nin and wild cherry is given in the, um, the ancient manuscripts, which have these sort of clue words, word ohms, um, for, for each of the letters. And the word ohm for the wild cherry, or for nin, is custod shida. And that literally means, uh, shida is, or she means um, a fairy, or otherworldly being, or god. And um, custod means staple enjoyment, or it means also, um, yeah, enjoying tasting staple supply. So literally the, the those two concepts together give us the idea of the food of the gods or the food of the other world, referring to nectar or honey. So we're looking at a tree that's noted for its nectar, which is a tree that has lots of blossom and um, 
the wild cherry is our native tree which is has the most spectacular show of flowers of any other so that's how we interpret the um the link between the word nin and and a tree so even though some scholars think that not all of the letters of the Om alphabet refer to trees in actual fact there is a strong link when you look at the clue words that are given in the manuscripts and uh, Neil McCutcher has looked at all of those and has um, linked, you know, made strong links between the words and the trees and other scholars as well. So there are the first five letters. So we have, just to recap really quickly over them, we have be meaning birch, lis meaning rowan, fern meaning um, alder, sal meaning willow and nin meaning wild cherry. So they're the first five trees of the uh, first five letters of the old alphabet, and the trees that are associated with those with those names. So next podcast we'll be looking at the next five letters and um, some other aspects of Irish culture probably as well. And I hope you've enjoyed that. I've really enjoyed looking up that information and sharing it with you. And. If you really like the content of this podcast, please, if you haven't already subscribed, please hit the subscribe button and click the like button and leave a comment. And I always love to read your comments. I love that interaction. Uh, It's such a joy to feel connected to all of you out there, all of you viewers out there in various far-flung parts of the world and in Ireland, of course, as well, and the UK. And um, it's really lovely to hear from you all. and if you are so inclined, um, uh, the Kofi account is linked below. So if you'd like to contribute to that, I'd be very, very grateful. And thank you so much for your time uh, listening. And I hope you've been, been enjoying your crafting or your knitting while you've been watching. And I really look forward to sharing more knitting with you the next time. I am so looking forward to getting into the idea of spring and um just starting new projects it's a real time of growth (laughs) where you really just want to cast everything on which is how i feel at the moment and i really look forward to that and to sharing those projects with you so in the meantime take care of yourselves and we'll see you very very soon uh and bye for now thanks for watching Don't stop.
deserves you That he deserves you Go with someone like me